Welcome to GS Podcast number 53. Um, it's a huge pleasure to welcome um, evolutionary behavioral scientist Gad Sad back to the podcast. He, he was on quite a while ago, but we had an excellent response to that episode. He, he's, always, uh, he's always funny, always knowledgeable. I always learn something from him. I might um, see if he wants a co-host job, actually. Um, but I, I have to say thank you to Gad as well. I, I tried to schedule him a little while back. Hard like so many technical problems and had to cancel then when we finally did get to speak uh, my computer just decided it didn't want to play so i had to had to improvise and uh, the conversation should be seamless so he, you shouldn't notice any of that it's all it's all good quality but uh, but thanks to gad for his patience um true gentleman uh, but as a result of that i've decided to completely upgrade the gs podcast order some fancy new shiny equipment which should be with me the end of this month so the end of april all the right through till may and uh, onwards you should know it's a huge uh, improvement in in sound quality and i wouldn't have been able to have done that if it wasn't for the wonderful support of the patrons of the show uh, you can support the podcast at patreon.com forward slash g spell checker and i'd like to take a quick moment just to thank all the new patrons by name so um feel free to mock or let me know if i've got your name wrong here goes john mahoney adam Daz Cooley, Brad Fisher, Shan McGurvin, Robert Howe, Bill Lillez, or Bill Lyles, you'll have to let me know, uh, Rebecca Schley, or Schley, let me know, Becca, uh, Daniel Hall, Daryl Yates, John R., Jan Gerhardt, Liz L., Jacko van der Beil, Jacko, Jaco, let me know, Keith Williams, Jonathan Prudo, David Eve, Eamon Green, Dan Ormston, Mark Sampson, Mark Holloway, Andy Hudson, Andrew Wood, Jesus and Mo. I actually met the creator of Jesus and Mo um, last month at the National Secular Awards. Lovely individual. Re- really enjoyed speaking to them. Um, Nick Denbow, Paul Mundy, John, Willis Leroy, Paul, Alan McElreevy, David Neely, Rob Gleish, and Dean Percy. Thanks to your very generous support um, and all the existing patrons, uh, the podcast will continue to improve. Thank you very much. Um, really enjoyed my discussion with Gad again this time. We, we touched on a number of topics. We, we delved back into trigger warnings. Uh, we talked a little bit about Chapel Hill and the um, slew of apologists emerging from that. Um, Charlie Hebdo and the controversy surrounding his field of study, which is evolutionary psychology. Um, so a, a wide range of things for you in this episode. Um, I really enjoyed our chat. I, ho- I hope you enjoy listening to it. Make sure you seek Gad out on Twitter. You can find him at Gad Sad. Uh, Sad is S W A D. He also has a wonderful YouTube channel called The Sad Truth. Um, well worth checking out. Um, make sure you follow him on Twitter. Tell him I sent you. Any follow up questions for him? Let him know there. You can keep up to date on the podcast at gspellchecker.com. Enjoy. So it's an absolute pleasure, back by popular demand, to welcome Gad Sad to the GS podcast again. Hello. Hey, Stephen. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Great. Thank you so much. We uh, we had a few hiccups last week when we tried to arrange this. So the, the gods of podcast were smiting us, I think. That's right. But finally, we've made it. We've, we have overcome. Um, last time you was on the podcast, you let us know all about this uh horrible phenomenon of trigger warnings it's sort of a a malady within academic circles colleges institutions i thought maybe you could just briefly give us a recap on what trigger warnings are so trigger warnings are so think for example when you're watching a television advertisement that's going to discuss animal cruelty and so since obviously many people are offended by or disturbed by such imagery or such realities then, of course, the courtesy is to warn people that, hey, there's going to be some disturbing images. So if you're, you know, if you're incapable to withstand such images, you know, turn away or turn the channel. And so taking this idea, trigger warnings, which have now 
become an insipid part of life at on university campuses is the idea that there are certain topics that necessitate trigger warning even when discussed in this in the context of a you know classroom discussion now you might think that uh, such trigger warnings are restricted to truly, you know, horrifying few few cases. But it turns out that if you, and I actually did this exercise, I, I, I wrote a Huffington Post article where I listed a whole bunch of topics that might necessitate trigger warnings. Well, pretty much everything under the sun that you could think of, whether it be pregnancy or consensual sex or drugs or disease or uh, uh, medical surgeries or war or I mean, literally anything that you could think of now necessitates a trigger warning lest it might offend somebody's uh, sensibilities. So essentially, you have to be studying kittens to be safe. <laughs> exactly. And of course, un unless, as I am, since I'm, I used to be asthmatic, I'm allergic to kittens, <laughs> maybe you have to give me a trigger warning <laughs> that you're going to discuss because I might get an autoimmune response just hearing the word kitten. Nobody's safe, Gad. Nobody's safe. Nobody's safe. Okay, so you, you've since we spoke about this last time and we was, we was in agreement on this issue, um, you, you've penned something for the Huffington Post, and I think I'll just quote what you say there. You say, trigger warnings are part of the West debauchery of self-indulgent victimhood. I was wondering if you could maybe expand on that a little bit. Well, it's, it's this idea that I think when people have it really well, but they wish to complain about something, uh, then they find, uh, you know, the victimhood narrative is a is a powerful narrative, right? I mean, there, there's a disorder. I don't know if you know it. It's known as uh, Munchausen disorder by proxy. Yes. Munchausen. So, for example, when a typically this is a biological mo mother uh, that harms her child on purpose, so and then she takes him or her to to the hospital, and then she, if you like, gets titillated at the sympathy that she receives. You know, she's a victim. She's oh my god, why is this happening to her, and so on. And it, and it is such a uh, diabolical disorder that in many cases these women end up killing their children in the pursuit, if you like, of that victimhood high. Well, in a sense, this is what happens on campuses, right? I mean, I want to feel, I mean, I want to be part of the privileged victimhood class. And so I need to, since I am, you know, sitting pretty in my campus in Wellesley in, uh, you know, in outside Boston, what can I complain about? Well, I complain about the fact that there are all sorts of concepts uh, that make me feel uneasy. And so that's what I mean by this debauchery, this indulgent debauchery of victimhood, right? Uh, it's grotesque. I mean, you go to university precisely because you wish to be exposed to Ideas that challenge you, ideas that make you think, ideas that are contrary to your established positions. And if every single time we're going to broach on a topic that might make you shift uneasily in your seat, well, we might, away, we might as well get, you know, get rid of universities. Exactly. I mean, I suppose, I mean, I, I was kind of a little bit snobbish about this and, and kind of mocked it as some sort of cross-Atlantic thing. I didn't think it really hit home in England, but I've noticed the um, things such as so-called safe spaces are quite prominent now. And I, I, I looked into them and I suppose the idea behind them, in a sense, is fairly admirable. It's for people who are part of the, the lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, transgender community who are able to be in an environment where they won't feel any prejudice. And I suppose that's that's an ideal society anyway. But it seems these safe spaces are now being exploited just to keep out ideas that people don't want to hear or dip, you know, people who have different politics than them. Oh, absolutely. I wrote another uh, Huffington Post article where I was uh, critiquing the lack of intellectual diversity on university campuses. Uh, there's a quote by Thomas Sowell, uh, an economist, a conservative economist. Uh, I'm slightly paraphrasing. He basically argues that the next time that sociologists complain about diversity, ask them how many Republicans serve in their sociology departments or something to that effect. Basically, mm -hmm. what he was, you know, uh, f you know, uh, critiquing is that all forms of diversity are welcome on, on campuses, whether it be sexual orientation diversity or skin color diversity or ethnic or religious or racial diversity. All diversity is good, except probably the most important form of diversity on campuses, which is intellectual diversity. Now, that's simply impossible to accept we all have to think alike i agree i mean w without being too dismissive of the people who engage in this sort of thing and I'm, I'm obviously convinced there's many exceptions but do you think it could possibly be a youth thing i mean i think when i was younger i, I viewed anyone who had conservative ideas 
to be the other, you know, to, I, I would, wouldn't want them in the conversation. And, and now as I've got older, I kind of think, you know, extremism where, is where you draw the line. Uh, you know, malice is where you draw the line. But left, right, you know, centre, you, you need everybody involved in the conversation at some point, don't you? Yes, although I, I wish that I could be as... Uh as charitable as you and only blame it on the indiscretion of youth. Mm -hmm. uh, many academic friends of mine uh, who are older than I am, and I'm right now, I'm, you know, middle-aged gentlemen, uh, are just as dogmatic, if not more so, than uh, the, the young people that you're referring to. So I, I'm not sure that dogmatism and intolerance towards ideas that are contrary to your position are strictly reserved for the youth. Uh, there was a in, in the in the study that in the in the article that I was discussing the Huffington Post article regarding intellectual diversity, I discussed briefly a study, and I also did this in a Psychology Today article. I discussed the study not done by me by some some colleagues, uh, where they had looked at across universities, this is American universities, uh, for the death penalty or not, or uh, what your foreign policy should be as a country, those are not you know, absolute, inviolable scientific truths. And having people who come from different uh, positions on the political spectrum is a good thing. And yet in the humanities and the social sciences, you're pretty much persona non grata if you are a Republican in academia. Okay, so there, there seems to be a majority of one particular political ideology then in making these kind of decisions? Uh, or at least in terms of who, who's represented within the faculty at American universities. Now, of course, that ratio of Democrats to Republicans changes, becomes more or less pronounced as a function of which discipline you're in. So in the social sciences and the humanities, the ratio of Democrats to Republicans is, is just astonishing, right? I mean, 44 to 1, 20 to 1, and so on. Now, as you go to some of the other fields, I mean, economics and business, some of the other hard sciences, then that ratio becomes uh, you know, more, more equal. And that itself says something, right? Because fields such as soci sociology is precisely where a lot of the political activism, at least amongst the, the student population, comes from, right? So this basically says that when you are in a sociology major, uh, you really are only being exposed to one set of political positions. And again, that's not a good thing. You don't have to agree with the opposite side, but they should certainly be equally invited to the table. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Um one of the things about doing this podcast is, is I have a full-time job as well, and there's a lot of angry blog posts that I've started that I've never got to publish because I just haven't had time. So <laughs> I, I've kind of been compiling some of these issues throughout the year. Yes. And I, I just thought it'd be a good good opportunity to speak about some of them with yourself. That'd be great. And uh, I thought we could talk about Chapel Hill, which was the, the horrible shooting in North Carolina. Um, uh, Stephen Hicks, yes. se self-described atheist. One of the first things I wanted to touch on was how quick apologists jumped on this story. Right. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, uh, one of the things that struck me is the use of, and I, I actually, my last Psychology Today article deals with exactly this issue, uh, how they usurp terms that are typically ascribed, uh, that are used to describe uh, religious folks. So militant atheists, atheist extremists, fundamentalist atheists, atheism is just another religion, you know, right, the gospel of atheism. And, and I thought that that's such a grotesque rhetorical device, right? Because uh, you see this often where uh, people are have a political ideology, and so they start redefining the meaning of words to fit their political agenda. So, for example, uh, when it comes to Israel, Israel engages in genocide. Israel is an apartheid, apartheid state. Israel is tantamount to Nazism, right? Mm. Uh, when you're talking about, say, uh, the feminists, uh, when it comes to rape, uh, the male gaze becomes a form of rape. So it's no longer that there actually has to be a violent sexual assault for it to constitute rape. Even the male gaze becomes rape. So you you get this usurping of words where words no longer have meaning. So in the context of the Chapel Hill case, all kinds of folks started jumping on the idea of, well, you see, atheism is just as violent as any religious ideology. It led to the killing of these three innocent, beautiful people. It's grotesque. Uh, yeah, I, uh, grotesque is a great word to describe as well. Some of the excitement that was clear in some of the usual suspects. Uh, uh, that's, it's almost like they've been waiting for this to happen. I mean, you look at people like Glenn Greenwald, 
they're, they're straight on something like this to say, to push this narrative that there's some sort of hostile, violent uh, in, inspiration behind atheism. It, it, yeah, I mean, it, it baffles me. I mean, I try to desperately avoid reading any of those gentlemen's materials because it, 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 it leaves you speechless to, you know, you wonder whether they genuinely believe in their uh, positions or whether they have some ulterior motives. And I, I really, I, I don't know, maybe you have a better insight into their, their psychology because it, it, it really behooves me to understand how they could hold these positions. Uh, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on their on their writings, but uh, it strikes me as bordering on the delusional. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's strange because the more they're challenged on it and the more evidence they're shown to the contrary, the deeper they, they invest in it. Uh, and uh, I, I just I think maybe sometimes it, it can be a pride thing. Maybe you, you've gone too far. And I mean, we don't need to argue that there's an issue between, there's a causal link between violence and religion because, you know, Islamists prove it every day. Uh, yes, they're still in, they're completely unopened to the evidence. Exactly. You know, there's a I can't. I, her name escapes me, but there's some apparently famous uh, journalist in Australia who uh, recently wrote an article in, in I think the Daily Telegraph uh, in Australia, where she was arguing that the the young Australian native Australian who converted to Islam and then went joined ISIS and then blew himself up in a suicide mission uh, she basically uncovered the key two <laughs> motives that drove him to join ISIS you know, f- you know several thousand miles away and it turns out that it's because he used to be an atheist and so what atheism is it creates this hole that then permits other ideologies to come in so it's one is atheism and number two it's the divorce of his parents to which I jokingly said, I am an atheist, and regrettably, my parents uh, recently separated after close to 60 years of marriage, so I'm booking my ticket to join ISIS, baby. <laughs> Miranda, Miranda Divine. Exactly. It, it, it was firmly on my radar, this. I mean, I, I'm a, my parents divorced when I was six. Uh, you know, my, my godless black heart. Uh, I mean, well, that's another thing that annoys me as well. She, there's a, there's a re- for people who are religious, they, they have this idea that atheism is something akin to nihilism. Right, 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 exactly. I mean, basically, once you're an atheist, that is pretty much synonymous with hunting down puppies, raping them, and then... <laughs> Them. That's what atheism is, because otherwise, how do I get my moral compass? Right? It must be through some divine, you know, c- uh, creator. Otherwise, we're all running around raping one another. It's unbelievable. I agree. I mean, I suppose I suppose I can play devil's advocate here because to an outsider, who's someone who's not really invested in this debate, we, we we're very quick to point out a causal link. I mean, we I say we atheists uh, quick to point out a causal link between. Um, religious belief and, and bad deeds yet yeah, this militant atheist uh, as he's been so called described Stephen Hicks and atheists are just doing the same thing saying well he's got nothing to do with atheism I mean I think we're right but do you think maybe on the face of it it might look like that to some people I mean it it, it can of course uh, but again I think it's a it's a big logical stretch but speaking of sort of faulty reasoning maybe we could touch on uh, another uh, uh great intellectual in quotes, uh, Mr. Russell Brand. <laughs> I've got him on my list. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, good. So I'm, I'm, I'm preempting your list. Uh, so I, I did a, a YouTube clip where I, I discussed his recent rant where he offered a whole set of other reasons that might drive people, Westerners, to join uh, these nefarious groups. And I have here a list. So alienation, loneliness, lack of participation in politics, loss of com- uh, community, the 2007-2008 financial crisis, free market radicalism, consumerism, and capitalism. There you have it. When you put all these together, that's what drives people to join <laughs> ISIS. So, uh, you know, I mean, when people – now, now some, some folks wrote to me and said, well, you know, why do you even bother to, to you know, offer a rebuttal to Russell Brand? And my answer is – uh, Russell Brand has a very, very big platform, right? A lot mm-hmm. more people listen to what Russell Brand have to, has to say than listen to me. And so if we don't challenge these guys who might be buffoonish but who have very big platforms, uh, then they're winning uh, uh, the war of ideas. Yes, I, I I completely agree with that. He ha- he has got a huge influence. I mean, the, some of the most kickback I've had on Twitter is my criticism of Islamism. Uh, secondly, 
doubting 9-11 conspiracy theories and thirdly having a dig at Russell Brand <laughs> but pe- people didn't like that and I mean it's I'm nothing against Brand I think he's an amazing comedian I, I, I count myself as a fan but his, his political um, uh, I- ideas remind me of being in school that there's this naive well-packaged well-intentioned platitudes that seem to get you off the hook of actually thinking anything absolutely and and, and actually the, the other guy I mean the the earlier version of Russell Brand but who otherwise comes in a cloak of greater sort of academic uh, uh, credentials is uh, my main man, I say that jokingly, Noam Chomsky. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I had done immediately before that YouTube clip, I had done another YouTube clip where I introduced, uh, some people knew this, but I introduced it sort of to the YouTube audience, this game I call the Six Degrees of Noam Chomsky Thinking. And basically, the way the game operates, uh, so it's 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 a play on six degrees of separation, which is. Are you familiar with what that notion is? Yes, yes. Right, so that you could take any two individuals around the world, and through six causal individual, I mean, you could you could link any two people, right? You usually Kevin Bacon. You, oh, that's, that's right. Six degrees of Kevin Bacon, exactly. <laughs> and so, six degrees of Noam Chomsky thinking is, works as follows: uh, I give you a calamity. So, for example, a a frog just died in the Amazon, and in six <laughs> causal steps or less, you have to uh, blame the U.S. military industrial complex. Right? Okay. And, and so that's the type of delusions that you have, right, where everything is viewed through the lens of this one great evil. So in the case of Russell Brand, it's, uh, you know, unregulated capitalism. In the case of Noam Chomsky, it's the U.S. military industrial complex. Again, it's it's so intellectually dishonest that it just it, it it attacks my sense of what's just. I think I think the problem we have and where there's a lot of misunderstanding here is that these things are actually real issues in their own right, and you, we do have good cause to be concerned about them. I think it's what they extrapolate from them that's the problem, and I think that's why it's so convincing. The the point to a real problem or a real issue, and it's the therefore bit that. I think is the jumping off point. That's not very convincing. Well, shouldn't be very convincing. I agree. Now, do you do you think? I mean, what's your intuition? Do you think that in the in the deep privacy of their thoughts, when they turn off the lights at night and they go into their bed, do they genuinely believe their stuff, or do they deep down inside know that they're engaging in BS? It's a good question. I think. I think. It's, I mean, it's hard to say. I'm not a big fan of saying they don't you know people don't really believe what they say they do i try and take them on value uh but i think maybe they they've said it so many times and that they want it to be true so much right. uh, that they've convinced themselves well you, you know and maybe that's a good jumping point to to an, another uh, idea i recently floated this have you he- have you heard of the evolutionary explanation for self-deception do you, do you, are you familiar with that at all i'm not no so do tell because I mean, we're talking about here whether they truly believe it themselves or not, right? So, so one of the th- one one of the other YouTube clips that I recently did uh, is on this idea of evolutionary roots of self-deception. I mean, why is it that people have such an uncanny ability to deceive themselves? So, for example, when somebody gets on American Idol, when you look at the the the, the contestants on American Idol, they seem to be completely surprised uh, when the judges tell them that they're you know they have horrifyingly bad singing voices. Now, why is it that they they're able to, to engage in such self-deception. And that conundrum was resolved uh, you know, many years ago now by uh, a very famous evolutionary biologist named Robert Trivers, who basically argued that uh, humans have to engage in a very complex set of social interactions, uh, a part of which involves having to be Machiavellian. So for example, I'm trying to deceive you to do whatever it is that I want you to do without you hopefully being aware of my manipulative intent. Now, in your case, you're going to be watching certain subtle nonverbal cues stemming from me that might, if you like, serve as telltale signs that I'm being duplicitous. Now, the way that I can stop that from happening is if I first deceive myself so that I don't emit these signals, then you're unable to read the fact that I am lying to you. And so he argued that self-deception is an evolved mechanism. So we first have to lie to ourselves in order to better lie to to others. Uh, so I thought that was a really brilliant uh, explanation. And I've used it uh, recently in describing, so I, I, I recently went on a marathon viewing run of House of Cards. Uh, are you familiar with that show? Yes, I love that show. I'm not completely up to date with series three yet, so no spoilers, please, God. Uh, 
Okay, I will keep uh, mum's the word. Uh, but in any, in any case, of course, Frank Underwood is a very accomplished liar. And I was trying to think, well, you know, why is he so good? And I think he is so good because ultimately he's able to first deceive himself that whatever he is doing or saying uh, is, is correct, that he's not lying and so on. And so it goes back to our original point where we were talking about some of those uh, individuals that we were discussing earlier. Uh, maybe you're right. Maybe in reality they do believe the stuff that they write because ultimately in order to deceive you they first have to deceive themselves okay i mean do you think maybe that ties a little bit into some of the things with some of the comments we've been seeing about the uh charlie hebdo attacks because i think i mean if, if you was to devise a situation where you could tick boxes for a, a scenario that would prove it was completely and totally religiously motivated it'd have to be a, a, a group of men storming a magazine to shoot cartoon cartoonists who've depicted mohammed and and they scream that we have um, avenged the prophet. the prophet muhammad right so it's i mean actually the way you framed it is exactly right right i mean when you think about scientific theories when we're testing a hypothesis we basically say well what is the the data that we need to collect and then analyze in order that we can test this hypothesis properly. And so one, one epistemological position is the so-called uh, Popper's falsification idea, right? So uh, I basically set up an experiment so that I can try as best as I can to falsify the theory. And if it's not falsified, if it's still standing there, then so far it's still good. Well, it seems that there is no amount of empirical evidence that could ever falsify the position that Islam never has anything to do with any of these realities, right? I mean, so so in a sense, it becomes akin to, for example, destiny. The idea of destiny is an unfalsifiable premise. That's why it can't be scientific. Why? If I step outside the house today and I am hit by a truck, well, that was my destiny. If I step outside the house today and I'm not hit by a truck, well, that was my destiny. So how could you ever falsify the the position, the metaphysical position of destiny? You can't. That's why it can't be scientific. Well, the same thing happens with these endless apings of this has nothing to do with this religious ideology. Well, what would be the data that I have to provide you so that you could start perhaps considering that it might have something to do with the reality well apparently nothing <laughs> yes nobody seems to want to take up that test do they no one wants to seem to, no one's willing to provide these parameters exactly it's it's it, and that's why it becomes if you like outside the realm of reason right it becomes something that you just take as an article of faith islam never has anything to do with any of these realities that's the starting point and any data that you give me that might falsify that premise we must attack it. It can't be true. Okay, I mean, so that explains a lot of the apologism for it. But in terms of standing up for free speech when this happened, I think there was a huge failure from mainstream media and the wider media in general to reproduce these comics, wasn't there? Oh, I mean, to use a word that uh, you seem to have enjoyed, it was grotesque, right? Yes. I mean, this, th right? I mean, je suis Charlie, right? Wow, bo my goodness, you deserve a medal of, of, <laughs> of, of freedom, right? I mean, everybody jumps on the bandwagon for the next 13 seconds and then we forget about it, right? Right? The point, though, is how does that lead to concrete actions? Well, the way that it could have led to a real, if you like, awakening of Western liberties and freedoms would have been for every single possible outlet to produce these cartoons, uh, not because they wish to frivolously offend people, but to reaffirm the importance of that value and so that the people who died did not actually die in vain. What did most Western media do? They said, well, we don't want to put them up because it's, we don't want to create unnecessary offense. So they did die in vain. Uh, so it's, it's grotesque. I, I think maybe as well, if people were just more honest about why they didn't want to reproduce these cartoons, I mean, they, they're all they're packaging, it, packaging it in a way as if to say we're trying to spare offence, the, the religious people can't handle offence and we want to spare hurt feelings. And that's not it, really. They're just afraid that they're going to be attacked, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. Listen, I, 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 and I've written about what I'm about to say next. Uh, there was a famous episode of, are you familiar with the show Curb Your Enthusiasm? Yes, I love Curb Your Enthusiasm. Pretty, oh. pretty. <laughs> pretty good. Well, do you remember the episode where he goes to visit some evangelical newborn Christian at her house? And as he goes to the uh, bathroom in her house, use her bathroom, uh, <laughs> for, 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 forgive me, I don't mean to cause offense here. So trigger warning, trigger warning. Uh, he ends up, his urine ends up splashing uh, on the image of Jesus. <laughs> it's what and, he would have wanted. Right. 
And then what ends up happening is that it, it looks as though uh, Jesus is is basically shedding a tear. So the lady comes in, and boy, it's a it's a miracle, and so on. Now, that is of very offensive to a lot of Christians. I mean, right? I mean, th- think about how offensive that is. I mean, potentially. Yet we didn't see embassies burned down. We didn't see innocent people being killed. Uh, Frank Underwood, going back to Frank Underwood when he, uh, on, on, uh, on House of Cards, there's a scene where he goes into the church to, to pray, uh, and then the, the, uh, the statue of, uh, of Jesus falls, and I think he spits on him or something. Uh, now, that's very offensive. There were no, right, the Book of Mormon uh, play, that's very offensive to Mormons. Uh, Jews themselves engage in endless satire of their religious principles. Nobody's killed. So why is it that there is one particular group of people that are simply unwilling or incapable to accept the fact that their religious ideology might be prone to satire? That's, again, unacceptable, right? That's what I call well, – actually, it's not me who calls this. I love the term uh, – the uh, bigotry of lowered expectations, right? Yeah. I mean it's, it's the idea that somehow Muslims are going to be different from the rest of us, that they just have a more violent trigger when you make fun of their religion. No, right? We're all equal. Everybody is equally prone to have their beliefs satirized. And if that's not something that you're willing to accept, then the plurality of the West is perhaps not for you. I mean, just on a, on a funny side note, I don't know if you saw the other day, Ali A. Rizvi, who I'm a huge fan of, he's, he's been on the podcast. I know you're, you like his work as well. Yes, we're, we're friends actually, yes. Great. Um, I don't know if you saw, he shared on his Facebook page this video on YouTube of, um, uh, uh, I think it may have been a Pakistani movie. I, I might be wrong about that. It looked very low budget, but it was essentially... Um, <laughs> a film where a character who's supposed to be Salman Rushdie gets chased down and attacked by flying Qurans that fire lightning at him and kill him. No, I didn't see that. <laughs> you, you're missing a treat. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll send a link out to that later, but if you get a chance, type that into YouTube. It's, it's, it's hilarious. But, I mean, one of the things on a more serious note that I wanted to ask you is this word that's been banded around a lot lately, which is nice. I think a lot of people have been pushing for this for a while, which is reform. Yes, Islam needs reform. I know people like Majid Nawaz are doing great work in this area at, at great risk to himself. I think Ayan Hirsi Ali's new book, which I think has just been released today, um, she talks a lot about reform. I was wondering how you you feel about this, and do you think it's uh, do you think it's likely? Uh, I mean, of course, that's exactly what is needed. Now, whether the doctrines permit for that reformation. I'm not so sure that that's possible. Uh, without necessarily pretending to be a, a you know an, an Islamic scholar, uh, I certainly know enough of the doctrines of Islam to to say that it is assumed that every single word, every single syllable, every single punctuation is the final inerrant word of God. Therefore, I'm not sure how the many problematic passages can be reinterpreted so that, you know, they are understood to be something different than what they are. Now, if somebody can be creative enough to offer some deconstructionist uh, endeavor that could reform those passages, uh, only time will tell. But I'm not sure that I'm as optimistic as some of the so-called reformers. I, I feel, you know, I feel exactly the same. I think that was that was going to make the same point that it's, the, the, the texts are not the same. I think Christianity, and as evil as the Old Testament, it, it, Old Testament is, it does provide a bit of, um, bit of wriggle room for interpretation and reform. That's right. Whereas, like, like you just mentioned, the, it's the literal word of the creator, the Quran, and it claims to be the final word. The, the, there's right. no more revelation. So I think, I think we can hope <laughs> that may be I mean I suppose it's got to start somewhere hasn't it and starting with a discussion about this I mean my only worry is people like Majid Nawaz don't get a hard time from secularists or atheists or you know humanist groups it's fellow Muslims that will denigrate him his name's been I mean obviously he'll have I don't want to demean all the people that are thinking of reform there'll be many Muslims that do um support him and um, wish him all the best. But many Muslim organizations and, and fellow Muslims in, in Britain have denounced him. Right, absolutely. It's, it's tragic. I agree. Look, the, the bottom line is that to be able to navigate through the issue that you're raising, 
uh, you have to do a content analysis of the religious texts. So, and I, I, I wrote an article about this recently where I, uh, so in, in some of my work, I, I argue that in, in order to be able to understand the evolution of the human mind, you could take cultural products that have existed for thousands of years and do a content analysis on these products to understand certain recurring universal themes. So for example, if I want to understand uh, what are the types of things that men and women sing about in songs, I could take songs stemming from very, very different cultures. I could even go back to a thousand years ago with the troubadours and show that, for example, on average, men are much more likely than women to sing about the beauty of women than vice versa. So that there are certain themes that are that if you do a content analysis of cultural products, they keep coming up over and over again. The reason why, for example, we are as moved today uh, by Greek tragedies as when they were first written is because we could completely relate to the themes that are discussed in those Greek tragedies. Sibling rivalry, status seeking, paternity uncertainty, sexual conflict. Now, the same exact tools of content analyses could be used to study the content of religious texts. And there's a gentleman who used to be a, a former professor of physics who the past uh, 11 or 12 years has dedicated his life to doing exactly that. So what he basically does is he opens up the Islamic holy books, and not, not only the Islamic holy books, he, he does the same thing for the Old Testament, the New Testament, and he provides a content analysis of those texts. So for example, he's able to answer how what percentage of the Islamic holy books are dedicated to peace versus dedicated uh, to the opposite of peace, to intolerance and genocidal hatred and so on. And so if you're going to reform Islam, then you'd have to be you'd have to go in and say, well, the I think I think he, he, he in 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 one of his analyses he points to something like sixty percent of the text is dedicated to the kafir, the non-believer, and a lot of that sixty percent says some really really nasty stuff about the kafir, what you should do to them, and so on. Well. I mean, it's going to take a lot of linguistic and semantic gymnastics <laughs> to reform all this. So I want to be in front of the line and saying, hey, I'm, 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 I very much want this reform to happen. Whether it is feasible or not, only time will tell, Stephen. And I think maybe, uh, in a sense, maybe it's only feasible in the West. I mean, when we're talking about reform... Uh, people like Ian Hersey, Ali and Majid Nawaz, they're not reforming from the hotbeds of this extremism, are they? I mean, they'd, they'd be, be killed... We'd, oh, absolutely. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, it just shows you what an issue we have with conservative Islam and Islamism in the West, where we're talking about it needs reform in, in, even in these civil societies. Absolutely. Uh, listen, uh, the, 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 wor the, the history of the past 1400 years is littered with the dead bodies of Muslim reformers who try to reform Islam from within and regrettably it didn't work. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that, you know, there aren't tons of Muslims who live very peacefully. Most do. It doesn't mean that they don't pick and, pick and choose the parts that they like, the spiritual elements, and then ignore the violent or political elements. But, you know, if you truly are going to reform all of the canonical religious texts, uh, I'd really like to see how that's going to happen. I, I just don't see it. No, fingers crossed. Maybe, I mean, I'd be happy to, for us both to be proved wrong on this one, I think. I'm sure you'd agree. I agree. I mean, I wanted to touch a little bit about, uh, on your area of expertise, which is evolutionary psychology. And I, I don't think it's unfair to say it's um, it's a little controversial. It has somewhat of a, a credibility issue within certain circles. Yes, Uh you know, it's. I think we might have touched a bit of the uh, of the stuff in our in my last appearance. There's a, a whole slew of folks uh, that hate evolutionary psychology for all of the wrong reasons. So, you know, religious folks will hate evolutionary theory because you know where's God and all this. The feminists will hate evolutionary theory because they don't uh, uh, want to concede that there might be innate sex differences. But even so, to your point, to your question, even amongst hardcore scientists. Even amongst some evolutionary biologists, they somehow feel uneasy about evolutionary psychology. And, and I've written you know, quite extensively about this. It's, it's quite a fascinating bias because they're, for example, perfectly willing to concede uh, that some evolutionary explanation – perfectly explains why the salamander has the mating behavior that it does. If we take the exact same set of principles and apply it for humans, 
it becomes a bunch of just so storytelling, right? Because th- this is what I call the human reticence effect. Well, not I call. This is it is known as the human reticence effect. The idea that evolutionary explanations are perfectly palpable as long as they don't then relate to humans and certainly to the human mind. So if I use evolutionary theory to explain why we've evolved opposable thumbs, that's okay. But don't you dare explain anything above the neck. Well, that's just a bunch of just so storytelling. And so I thought that maybe I could briefly touch on that particular criticism because in reality, that's perhaps the only one that scientists who who hate evolutionary theory ever propose, the idea that evolutionary psychologists just come up with a fanciful post hoc stories. So maybe I could give one or two examples to, to dispute this idea. Absolutely. I'd love to hear them. So here's the, the, if you like, the strategy that evolutionary psychologists use, and it's known as nomological networks of cumulative evidence. In other words, when you're testing a hypothesis, it's not one set of data that, if you like, proves your hypothesis. Rather, you collect data from a wide range of sources, which then supports your hypothesis. So I'll give you two examples. If we wish to study whether toy preferences are learned or innate, the the social constructivists, the social scientists argue that, no, it's completely learned. That's what ends up gender socializing us, right? Boys play with trucks, girls play with dolls, and that's how we get our gender roles. Well, let me give you this nomological network of cumulative uh, evidence that completely disputes this silly idea. So you could take children who are in the pre-socialization stage, meaning that they are too young to be socialized, and they exhibit those sex-specific preferences. Little boys will stare at images of trucks much longer than at images of dolls and vice versa for girls. So by definition, they couldn't have been socialized because cognitively they are in the pre-socialization stage of their cognitive development. You could take little girls who suffer from congenital adrenal hyperplasia. This is a endocrinological disorder that masculinizes little girls. What do you think happens to their toy preferences? They now become similar to those of boys. You could take other species. So you take vervet monkeys and rhesus monkeys and children within those species, infants within those species, and they exhibit the exact same sex-specific toy preferences as humans do. You could go to Sweden, which is the most egalitarian country in the world when it comes to gender roles. And what do you think are the sex-specific toy preferences? They're exactly the same as anywhere else on earth. Let me give you one or two other examples. uh, There's been an analysis done of funerary art, meaning art on funeral monuments, dating back to ancient Greece and ancient uh, Rome. And the depiction of little boys and little girls depict the exact same sex-specific toy preferences. So look how many different sources of data I have provided you, endocrinological, developmental, archaeological, uh, that demonstrates that the idea that it's all due to random socialization is not true. Now, let me, may I give you another, one other example? Please, go ahead. So let's suppose you look at the waist to hip ratio preference. So there's this uh, theory that evolutionary psychologists have proposed that men have a preference for a waist to hip ratio of 0.7, because that ratio of 0.7 turns out, and this has been demonstrated through studies, epidemiological studies, women who have that hourglass figure are less likely to have diseases. They're more likely to be nubile and fertile. So it would make evolutionary sense that men prefer the body type uh, of the hourglass figure than the body type of Michael Phelps, the Olympic male swimmer. (laughs) Now, how do we go out and test such a thing? Did we just come up with this fanciful story or did we actually collect an extraordinary broad range of data? So let me give you some data. So you could, you could go to very, very different cultures, radically different cultures in the, in the Amazon versus in Manchester where you might be, and you show people different figurines, and each of which corresponds to a different uh, waist-to-hip ratio. And it pretty much turns out that men in most cultures will agree that the 0.7 is the one that's preferred. You could do a content analysis of art statues from India, from Africa, from Greece, and from Egypt spanning thousands of years. And if you measure the waist-to-hip ratio of the female figurines, they tend to be 0.7. I did a study where I looked at the waist-to-hip ratio of female escorts, prostitutes, as they advertise their body measurements online. How did did you carry out this study, God? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, actually, this is a funny story. I had an undergraduate student who had approached me saying, look, I just want to work with you. Give me some tasks to work on. And so I thought for a while and I said, hey, what do you think about surfing some porn sites for the next couple of weeks? To which he answered, Dr. Saad, I love you. Uh, <laughs> and basically, he actually went ahead and went to all of these different uh, online and escort porn sites and actually transcribed their measurements. And he did it for 48 countries that are radically different. And what was roughly the waist-to-hip ratio that they advertised? 0.7. Now, I could give you many more, but let me give you sort of the kicker. There's been a study that's been done using – now, you're ready for this. You're sitting down. I'm congenitally complete. blind men, meaning men who were born blind. So they couldn't have been socialized by Hollywood images and cosmopolitan. By definition, they've never seen anything. And so they got these men to provide their – waist to hip preferences, but using touch, right? Using haptic method. So they gave them different silhouettes. They touched them. Which silhouette did they prefer? 0.7. So look at the number of completely different sources of evidence ha that has been co collected to arrive at this 0.7. And yet this idea that evolutionary psychologists just sit with a brandy coming and, you know, <laughs> with smoking marijuana and coming up with these fanciful, you know, BS stories is laughable. If anything, evolutionary psychologists typically set a much higher evidentiary threshold to test their hypotheses. Yet they are accused of exactly the opposite and it pisses me off <laughs> <laughs> see i think uh, the radical feminist must hate you i believe but i mean what, so i mean you've got all this data all this information i mean it sounds almost scientific i'll be honest with you <laughs> <laughs> yeah you might even think that evolutionary psychologists might be real scientists but i mean what so what i mean i'm assuming you know some of the arguments against your position uh, as most good scientists do i mean what what kind of form do they take usually what do you hear well i think the problem is that people think that whenever you're coming up with explanations for ultimately causes that happened in a distal past, somehow it is shady. You're coming up with quote, post hoc stories. So it's, you understand what I'm saying? It's a bias whereby if they don't do the experiment in front of their eyes, then somehow you're just engaging in post hoc uh, theorizing. Hmm. Well, of course, my rebuttal to this and usually it shuts them up pretty quickly. Uh, if that were true, then geologists must be BS scientists because usually they're studying things that are billions of years old. Uh, those astrophysicists much, must be a bunch of BSers. They're studying things that are much further back distally than evolutionary mechanisms. How do, how do they come up with uh, th theories regarding the Big Bang that happened several magnitude order of years further than evolution. So the idea that, you know, science only operates as long as you're able to set up some experimental design and see it in front of your eyes is laughable, right? Much of the natural sciences have a histori historicity element to it, whether it be geology, geology or oceanography or astrophysics, astronomy. So, but for some reason, Evolution is so laden with so, what, what people think are sort of political and ideological implications that people just go crazy with it. Okay, I mean, you was um, you basically you was seeing other podcasts recently, which uh, I'm not too happy about, but we'll we'll breeze past that. Um, you, you spoke to a gentleman. Was he called Chuck Morse? Was his name right? So he he, he basically contacted me and said, "Hey, uh, you know, I've heard about your your scientific work. I'd like to cover a few of your books." Uh, hey, would you like to appear on my podcast? And so I quickly did a, a search on him, you know, online. I thought, okay, he seems like a slightly kooky guy, but sure, you know, if, if I have a nice forum to discuss my scientific work, why not? So I accepted to get on his show, and I think you listened to the full podcast. It was <laughs> I tried to listen to the full podcast. <laughs> it was an unbelievable ambush uh, because all he wanted to discuss is how, uh, well, you know, genetics is a real science, and, you know, biology to some extent is a real science, but there's nothing about evolution that makes it a science. Well, biology is based on evolution. <laughs> and so he started aping the usual, I mean, just astonishingly dumb uh, creationist positions. So things like, well, I mean, you know, 
I don't believe – I mean I believe in microevolution. I mean he didn't use those terms, but that's what he was getting at. But macro – I mean I've never seen a leopard turn into a rabbit. And I've never seen a rabbit turn into a crocodile because they genuinely believe that the way evolutionary uh, you know, speciation works is where one species magically you know, evolves into another one before your eyes. This is why Mel Gibson will say something like, how could evolution be true if we've evolved from monkeys? How come both monkeys and us, and, and us are still walking around? on earth so this is the kind of stuff that i was exposed to and i have to thank you for having noticed how restrained and polite i was on that show <laughs> you was exceptional there's there's no way i could have managed that but i did I, I mean i got into a bit of a back and forth with this gentleman on twitter and, well did you uh, yeah and he he basically dropped dropped the bomb essentially and uh, provided me with a link which i've, I've since forwarded on to you about his book yeah, so he has an Amazon ebook. Uh, Chuck Morse, this gentleman. Now the book's called "Apostles of Evolution: The Practical Result of the Evolutionary Faith." So you know where you are there straight away. There and you go. It's it's, a, go it's accompanied by three images. So we have um, Charles Darwin, sure, understandable. Uh, Karl Marx is on the front cover, and Adolf Hitler is central. <laughs> Yeah, this so this comes from the idea. So, so in 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 my in the chapter one of my uh, trade book, the Consuming Instinct, I list nine, if you like, common attacks that people levy against evolutionary theory. So the one that relates to uh, Hitler is the one that basically argues that since a wide range of miscreants have used evolutionary theory to advance their political agenda. So the Nazis did it, the uh, social class elitists in Britain did it, hence the term social Darwinism, eugenicists have done it. So because all of these folks have utilized, I mean, utilized in quotes, principles from evolutionary theory to support their political ideologies, well, therefore, Darwinian theory is evil. Of course, there's no such thing as such a link, but you keep hearing it aped over and over again. And that's why I've been called. At, I remember one um, interaction I had where somebody said, oh, you're one of those evolutionary psychologists. You must be a Nazi, to which I answered, well, congratulations. You've just uncovered the Jewish Nazi of the contemporary world. I said, oh, you're Jewish. Okay, well, you're not a Nazi, but you, you must hate women, right? I mean, I somehow must be filled with an ulterior agenda if I am an evolutionist. It's, again, to use a term that you like, it is grotesque. Esque. Yeah, I mean, talking of uh, gross and racist, I think Ben Affleck's been very quiet since his Bill Maher appearance, hasn't he? <laughs> you know, I went for – since the Bill, since the, uh, Bill Maher episode – uh, I, I wrote an article on Psychology Today about this. I appeared on a show about this. So I got a lot of traction in, in 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 hating on Ben Affleck, and I tried to connect with him on uh, Twitter a bunch of times. I always uh, tag him. Uh, apparently, he's ignored me so far. But I, I I hold out hope that one day he might engage me. You, you never know. I think I think when you're um, a mainstream actor in in the states, it's it's very very uh, ill-judged to get involved in, in politics and religion to a certain extent. I think it can... Uh, I mean, uh, touching back a little bit about something similar that happened in the UK, we David Cameron, our, our Conservative Prime Minister, was making noises about how Britain's a Christian country. And in, yes. in, res in response to this, a, a group of respected academics, scientists, public uh, entertainers, all signed an open letter to him um, denouncing this idea. And it was published in, I think it was in the, the Daily Telegraph or another big publication. And I thought, if that was the swing side of things in the States, do you think a group of public uh, figures or actors and mainstream uh, entertainers would get together to oppose something of religiosity that Obama might say? Uh, only if uh, the the religion that he he was peddling uh, wasn't the religion that we're both familiar with, right? In other words, if, if he were to say, we are a Christian country uh, under the... Uh, the protection of God, well, that's unacceptable, and a whole bunch of people, including academics, would contest that possibility. Uh, on the other hand, if he says – if you replace the word Christianity with Islam, then people would be a lot less willing to openly criticize this. In other words, it is very, very progressive to criticize all religions except one. Yeah. 
And um, <laughs> we do have a, I don't think it's unfair. I mean, both me and you, I suppose, will probably be accused of singling out Islam in general, but I don't feel that that's without merit. I don't feel there's anything sinister about my intentions to notice we have an issue with one ideology in particular, which is greater than most other ideologies in that sense. Well, again, think of it this way. What would be the data that would be needed <laughs> for you to hold that position, right? So, so in other words, if, if again, if I were to say, hey, Stephen, would you like to do a thesis examining the number of uh, terrorist attacks that have been committed by the top 20 religions? Well, as a matter of fact, that data exists. So, for example, the University of Maryland has a global terrorist database where they keep track of all the terrorist acts. The Canadian and U.S. government has a database where they keep track of all uh, terrorist groups. Uh, the FBI has a list of all the most wanted terrorists around the world. Now, if we took all that data and many other data, would we come to the conclusion that it is the Amish that are the most dangerous, <laughs> Seventh-day Adventists, <laughs> atheists? So, again, this says nothing about the fact that most individuals are perfectly peaceful, kind, lovely. Uh, as a matter of fact, having grown up in the country that I have, I probably could make that statement better than most people, right? 99.9% .9 of Muslims that I've ever met are nothing but lovely. Mm. So what? That, ha that says nothing about whether the so-called small minority who does wish to do very, very bad things in the name of their religious views uh, is going to do those things, right? So I, I, cannot, I cannot have solace in knowing that, hey, all the people that I know are very nice. They're not the ones that I'm afraid of, right? Um, so again, it's the idea of very scientifically, very detached, what is the data that we will need in order to be able to speak honestly about this? And apparently, the current data is not enough because we're still spewing the standard delusional platitudes. It's crazy. I mean, I wanted to touch a little bit on how people like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins are getting a little bit of flack for things like the Chapel Hill. Um, that there seems to be this um, idea that just because they're critical, vocally critical of ideology in their writing, that this can lead to um, a manifestation of violence from people who who take on board their writing and to me there is nothing in either of those two people's works that promotes violence endorses violence suggests we should be distrustful of muslims as a whole uh, i mean what, what do you think about that again it astonishes me that they face such a uh, diatribe right i mean and again frankly it speaks to how dishonest uh, the, i i frankly don't believe that in the in the deep recesses of their mind, the people who levy these accusations truly believe them. I genuinely can't imagine. I mean, as a psychologist, I can't come to the conclusion that somebody can truly, genuinely believe that Richard Dawkins is a hate monger who's calling for the extermination. Blah, blah. I mean, it's just, it's impossible to read <laughs> anything that he says with that lens or with that, you know, interpretive perspective. And so, again, I think it is a duplicitous strategy that is meant to certainly stifle them and stifle all those who are coming behind them. Be careful. If you criticize, if we can't behead you here, we certainly can behead your reputation, right? So, depending on which country you live in, the cost of criticizing a particular ideology varies. But what's happening in the West is well, I mean, there is the threat that there could be bodily harm, but to the extent that it can't be guaranteed that we will harm you physically, we certainly will go out of our way to harm your reputation. And that's what happens to guys like Ayan Hirsi Ali and Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins. And it's truly regretful because I know some of them personally, and uh, they're about as liberal as you can get. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I mean, for those for, for, for folks... For example, in academia who purport to be liberals should certainly be championing someone like Ayan Hirsi Ali because she is the model of liberal values. And meanwhile, uh, you know, she's stopped from speaking in places because she is a hate monger Islamophobe. And so up is down, left is right. Uh, the world is a crazy place. Yeah. I mean, it, there's some strange, bizarre irony, though, that those that are saying that <laughs> there is a direct link between adhering to the writing of <laughs> Harris and Dawkins and violence, yet they will not concede that there's a similar link between the extreme verses of the Quran and the actions of Islamists. 
isn't that extraordinary, right? So, so, so they feel that they have the necessary data. I mean, it's ex- what, what you said is exactly correct, right? They, they feel that they have, quote, data to suggest that whatever Sam Harris has written has compelled people to commit violence. Yet there is absolutely no evidence anywhere in Islamic texts that any passage could compel people to engage in violence. It's hallucinatory. And- I- incidentally, I, if I may, there's a wonderful, wonderful in its duplicity, there's a wonderful strategy that uh, folks will use to shut people up if they engage in, 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 in certainly in an honest appraisal of some of these texts. They'll usually start with a set of questions until they get to a question that somehow invalidates you as a proper critic. So, for example, uh, if you start making some pronouncement about some uh, texts and in, in, in within the Islamic te- uh, canonical texts, they'll say something like, "But you don't speak Arabic," mm. and you say, "Well, but I do." But you didn't, you weren't raised in an Arabic country, uh, but I was, uh, and so they'll keep going until they get. But you don't have a PhD in Islamic studies, but let's let's suppose I said, "But I do." But you got it at Princeton. You didn't get your PhD from Al Azhar University in Egypt. You say, "No, but I did." Uh, well, you weren't one of the 12 faithful companions of Muhammad. Well, no, I didn't live 1,400 years ago. Ah, there you go. So shut up. Don't you dare speak. You're just a professor of evolutionary psychology. How, what do you know about it? Right. So, so the strategy is to ask repeated questions until you fail on one of the questions. And then, of course, this invalidates your ability to offer any insight as to the issue. And again, that stems from the fact that an honest appraisal and a discussion can't be had. And so we're going to try to ruin the reputation of this individual. And that's exactly what happens with guys like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins. Yeah, it becomes about it becomes about silencing your critics, doesn't it, rather than engaging with the arguments. Exactly. And listen, uh, totalitarian ideologies. So think, for example, of the Khmer Rouge. I mean, the Khmer Rouge came in in Cambodia and they they got rid of anybody who exhibited any sign of having been learned. They were so concerned about having learned people stay alive that if you wore glasses, this was viewed as a sign of possibly intellectualism and you should be killed for wearing glasses, right? So totalitarian ideologies don't go after people who have big muscles. They go after people who have big brains because those are the individuals who could stand to confront your totalitarian ideology. It happens with uh, Mao, it happened with Stalin, it happened with Khmer Rouge, it happens with every totalitarian ideology. Get rid of the intellectuals. And this is what happens to people like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins to the extent that they are they have, they, they're folks who have very big platforms. They have to be killed. If not literally, then we do it uh, figuratively by silencing them in terms of uh, you know their reputation. Great point. Um, Gad, was there any other topics you wanted to touch on before I jump into my last pithy question? Uh, no, take it away. Okay, I mean, I always try and find something as divisive as possible uh, to end on. <laughs> because um, all the stuff that we've been discussing is not divisive yeah. enough. <laughs> exactly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to local academics and see if I can get some sort of porn research grant and say uh, Gad Sad <laughs> sent me, I think. Uh, but uh, talking back to Ben Affleck, uh, we've got Batman versus Superman out next year. Do you think uh, Affleck will make a good Batman? Yes or no? Uh, no. Oh, why? Uh, hey, wimpy. Wimpy. <laughs> <laughs> not batty enough not batty enough exactly I, hey listen I'm I'm available I'm willing to lose a few pounds and I think I would look very very good in that bat suit I'll get the petition up when we've uh, when we hang up <laughs> sounds good Gad thank you very much for talking to me it's been a blast oh it's a pleasure thank you so much Stephen thank you very much to my wonderful guest Gad Saad you can find him on Twitter at Gad Saad uh, that's Saad with two A's and thank you very much for listening I think we've all learned something here today. <laughs>